welcome friends to this monthly meeting we are having each month on a friday the idea of having these meetings is that we should stay on track in our spiritual journey because our mind is what it is it leads us into external thoughts it takes us away from our main purpose of having a human life our main purpose of having a human life is to find something that we could not find in any other form of life it's only in human form that we experience a unique thing that's called free will the ability to cho- make a choice the ability to seek and when we seek we can find if we cannot seek we cannot find so this ability does not exist in any of the other 8.4 million forms of life that have been listed some of these old books so since our mind is so occupied with trivial things trivial things like objects property people relations i call them trivial because in a cosmic time sense they are here with us for a very very short time in terms of cosmic time these are few seconds that we are here and yet we give all our attention to these things and then we are hoping that we will keep these things and nobody has ever kept these things neither have we been able to keep any property nor have we kept any friends nor have we kept our relatives neither parents nor children we leave all behind when we die and this physical body dies nobody has been able to preserve it for even more than i say 100 and 120 years nobody so that's why we know it's a very short period that we have in this physical form and yet we are so attached to things outside i read an interesting article by some panel of physicists scientists physics scientists they said something that i have been saying for 45 years they said they found out that time space exists simultaneously in one form only that past present and future exist at the same time this this is physics today because they were able to study that in this world there are lot of events of the past and lot of events of the future taking place right now at the same time so that can't happen if they really time was flowing so time never flows we have come for a very short journey in this time space i left yesterday on the 20th of this month from tokyo at 6 pm in the evening and i arrived yesterday in chicago at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon same day i arrived 3 hours earlier than i left but this is a very minor thing because they had to account for the revolution of the earth and there is an international date line where you cross you either gain a day or you lose a day but the idea for a person who hasn't been traveling like that is strange that you can leave in the evening and reach the same day i remember some years ago i had breakfast lunch and dinner in tokyo and i came the same day i reached hawaii in honolulu and had my breakfast lunch and day and dinner again on the same day so time can be like that but this time space which is now subject of great investigation because that is holding the key of creation they finding out that if there was no time space there would be no creation at all if there is no time you can't have anything everything that takes place in creation as we know it is because of time even space which they have not yet found but they will and i have been saying this for years even space is created by time if you cannot have from now to then you can't have here to there that is why even space is subject to that but at least they found out einstein einstein helped them to find out that space time is one unit 
Now, when we look at these things, these are physics trying to see things from observation at a created universe. And they have not much awareness that this universe they are experiencing or looking at is a physical universe with some part of it overlapping with another universe called the astral universe. We know it for centuries. We know it for thousands of years. That, that is how the creation has taken place. It has taken place in overlapping creations, overlapping universes created. But these people are finding out now that they can see something only through radio telescopes, not visual telescopes. They can see something which exists. They can't know what exists. They have found what is called dark matter. Dark matter, they can't see it. None of the properties of matter, yet it is there. Because it emits the same radioactive energy that matter emanates from. So therefore, they are now looking at things in a very different way. But we have been talking about this for a long time. The knowledge of spiritual awareness, which can take you to different levels of consciousness, has been existing in this world since the inception of this world. Since this world came into being, this knowledge has been there. And people who had this knowledge also existed. They were in different forms at different times. But they all had this knowledge that this universe is only a very, very small fraction of total creation. They did not know, these scientists don't know, that each one of us has the capability to see the remaining dark matter and dark energy also. And we know where it is coming from. They are still trying to find out. Only some time back, they thought that the dark energy was the bulk of the creation. Dark matter and dark energy. And only 17% was visible to us. Last week, they have narrowed this down. Only 6% is visible to us. And 94% is unknown to us. As yet, we can measure it. It's there. They have also found that the universe operates on certain principles which cannot be explained by them. But the principles are there. And in order to justify some experiences they have, they have to now go beyond the four dimensions that were known till now. The four dimensions, three of space and fourth of time, were known for a while. But the fact that there are 11 dimensions, one of the leading Physicists today, following Einstein's work, a Japanese scientist, he says, I have discovered that if you call the creator God, that God must be the strings of melody that are being played in the 11 dimensions of this creation. This is the first time I have heard a very important scientist saying that this is a song, a music that is creating the universe. The string theory came earlier, but the fact that there's a melody that can be seen everywhere is only known now. We didn't have those instruments to go into very minute observations of things like electrons, parts of atoms. Now they found out that even in an atom, everything moves rotates, goes round and round, creating a hum, a sound. That's interesting. And I wrote an article about primordial hum many years ago. They're finding things today. They are at a very strange situation where they have to move from physics to metaphysics. And it's going to happen because they're struck with these problems here. And none of them seem to know that we have capability as human beings to seek knowledge of all these things, not in any institution, not in any college or university, but within ourselves. That we have this great treasure of knowledge sitting inside our heads, all of us, all human beings, without exception. 
that all we have to do is to go within our head and find out where the treasure is. We don't go inside our head because we are attached to temporary things we are watching outside. What a great irony and a pity that so much treasure should be inside our heads and we should be wasting all our time on things that will never go with us are not permanent and everything is changing. If we go within ourselves, we can find that the secret they are finding of music outside is coming from inside and there's more music inside than ever existed outside. They are looking for light in the dark matter. There's more light inside than ever existed outside. And these are experienceable. It's not just a theoretical model that we have. So many people have experienced and any one of us can experience it. All it requires is to use your attention, which is the only available part of consciousness that you can manipulate and use. You can't change awareness. You're sitting in this hall. Supposing you want to say, let's make it into a garden. It won't. Awareness of a particular creation outside does not change. But you have the right at any time to put attention wherever you like into your awareness. We are constantly putting our attention on things outside. How about putting attention inside? Whoever has put attention inside has been able to see the light and the, the, hear the music that exists in all of us. There is no exception to it. Some take longer. Why longer? Because of their attention scattered outside. If the attention were not scattered outside, they would take no time because the power of attention is still the same. And where do we put attention inside? People give up putting attention inside because they close their eyes and this darkness. They don't realize they are not putting their attention inside at all. Their attention is outside, they close their eyes, attention is outside and they can't see anything. Therefore it's dark. Putting attention inside is not the same thing like closing your eyes. Putting attention inside is withdraw your attention from outside. Don't put it outside and then pin it inside. At a point which even medical profession has recognized is the seat of consciousness. Right in the center of the head where the pineal gland and the pituitary body just above the medulla oblongata for those who want to know about the exact position in anatomy that's the center, most protected part with a skull. Most protected part of our human body is right in the center, behind the eyes, between the ears. We know exactly where it is. If we put attention at that point, and some people say it's very difficult to find the point. No, we are there at that point now. We only operate from that point. Where the question of finding are you trying to find where you are? You already are there in the wakeful state. In this physical body, our notional point from where we operate as conscious beings shifts from time to time. It shifts during the night. When we go to sleep, it comes down and lowers itself. As we feel sleepy, it looks like our eyes are descending here. And we think we are looking at the eyes, but actually looking the point behind the nose. When we go down further and are starting having dreams, the notional point drops here. At least you can check that out. Sorry for my bad throat today. At night when you're going to sleep, very, very sleepy, you're feeling sleepy but not sleeping. Try to touch your eyes with your eyes closed. Anybody with their eyes closed in the wakeful state can touch the eyes, know where it is. Our hands know where the eyes are. With your closed eyes, you can touch the eyes. Try to do the same thing when you're sleeping. You touch your nose and you think you are touching your eyes. If you could hold your attention when you're really almost asleep, you touch below and think you're touching your eyes. So it shifts. It's only in the wakeful state that we have the, uh, our center from where we operate as a conscious being at the third eye center, what they call third eye center. And they're very appropriately called third eye center because these two eyes 
don't see what we are seeing. These two eyes see two different pictures. We don't see one or two pictures, we merge them. We merge them to create a distance. You can do that in many movies now, 3D movies. You put glasses and a simple screen where two pictures are being shown. They look like one picture and things come close to us. That's exactly what's happening with these two eyes. If we did not have two eyes, the whole world would become flat. It's only because of the two eyes that we are able to create distance. Otherwise, there would be no distance at all. In vision, the distance is only created because the two eyes combine. Where do they combine? You don't see in the eyes, but then you see two pictures. You see behind the eyes. You see exactly at the third eye center. Whenever you are seeing with the three eyes physically, you are seeing from the third eye center. So that's why it's appropriately called the third eye because that's where you actually see the physical universe. You've got two ears. So you can establish from which direction the sound is coming. Otherwise one ear would have been enough. One eye would have been enough. So to create distance and direction, this physical body has been designed like that to create these experiences. But to talk of the inner outer experience is one thing. But now I am trying to say, what about putting attention on where you already are. You don't have to go and find some place. You already are there. Then what is needed to put your attention at the third eye center is merely your attention there. That means if you think of nothing else, your attention goes with thoughts. If you think of nothing else except what is happening at the third eye center where you are, not the body, where you are, the conscious being, whatever your form is over there, it could be very different. But whatever you are, you think from there, you talk from there, you see from there, you hear from there, that's a good place to put your attention on. So if you put your attention in the third eye center and more importantly, not at the same time put attention on outside things. A lot of people are putting so much attention outside. They keep on thinking of outside things while they think they are meditating at third eye center. How can they get any results at all? I get so many emails from people who say we hear that if we put attention there, we can see the radiant form of our master who has initiated us. And I say certainly, if you put your attention there, after a little experience of being there, you will see the radiant form. Hundreds of people are telling me, why don't we see the radiant form? Because when they try to see radiant form, they're thinking of all the other business of the world. They never withdraw their attention. Withdrawal of attention is a new thing for most people because we never practiced it, never tried it. There was no opportunity for doing it. Focusing attention on things, we tried again and again and became experts. We are experts now in focusing attention on things. So even when we try to withdraw attention, we still focus attention. Focusing attention is always on something other than yourself. You can't focus attention unless there's something to focus on. We have been focusing attention on books, studying, people, talking to them, and leave, leading entire our life by focusing attention on things. And now suddenly, the radiant form comes if you withdraw attention, not focus attention. People even try to focus attention inside, close their eyes and try to make themselves in a little miniature form and focus attention on that, thinking that's, that's themselves. Didn't they realize that when they are looking at something, it couldn't be them, it's something else. They are the one looking at it. People are meditating, saying, we see ourselves sitting there. If you see yourself sitting there, that's not you. Because you can't see yourself. Nobody has ever seen their own eyes except a reflection. Nobody, in any form, no matter what form of life you are, you can't see yourself. You can see outside with these physical eyes. The inner eyes can see not other things too. So instead of withdrawing our attention, which requires time and patience, it requires that we practice something that does not allow our attention to go out. If you haven't practiced that, 
You say, I want the radiant form inside. It won't come. The radiant form does not come unless you have put your attention to an extent that none of it is flowing out to anything outside, not even to your body. So there is some preparation required when you want to have the radiant form of your master as an experience. And it's just an experience, by the way. To see the radiant form of your master or to see anything else is just an experience of the self. It's not a self. There was one friend of ours and he was a master. He lived in Usharpur, where I also lived, my father lived, we knew him. And he was appointed by his master to be a perfect master. He gave initiation to a lot of people. Very honest man. He said that he had practiced meditation and seen things inside and outside and seen things at higher levels of consciousness. And he said, maybe I even saw what they call such hard out through home. He says, I saw everything. And yet I realized I was not enlightened at all. Seeing things does not make you enlightened. Knowing who you are, who saw things, makes you enlightened. It is knowledge of yourself, who you are. If that is not answered, and you keep on having different experiences, it does not make you enlightened. The spiritual path is for knowing who you are. Socrates said, know thyself. He didn't say, see a lot of things. Unless we know who we are, we are not enlightened. We don't know the truth about ourselves. If we knew the truth, it will start with us. Because we will find that we are a soul, not the mind, not the body. Not our sense perceptions, not the astral body, not causal body. We will discover a soul is just a unit of consciousness that exists in its own totality. What we call in Indian scriptures, Atma and Paramatma. They say Atma is the soul and Paramatma is the creator. Paramatma is supposed to be total. Nothing can be outside of Paramatma, not even the soul, not even this world. Everything is inside Paramatma. He is present everywhere. That means the soul, Atma, is also present in Paramatma. To discover that the soul is just Paramatma in individuated consciousness is a very big discovery. It immediately tells you that you can from Atma become Paramatma just by expansion of your awareness. We have no idea that this is what we are. We are all embodiment of the whole creator sitting inside us at this time. And we are just sitting outside looking through a projection of the truth. The truth lies inside. That will be so startling to find out who we are. We are total. There is nothing existing outside of us except experiences that we create for ourselves, including this physical world. So, that mystic said, although we had got all this awareness and got high experiences, it was a long time later that he realized that he had not been enlightened. When other people began to see him in their meditation, because he initiated them. And he said, how can that happen? That I don't know some things and other people say that I am helping them. There was a lady who had very lot of pain in her body at night and she cried for help. She was the initiate of this mystic and the mystic appeared in front of her and she saw him with the physical eyes and he said, my dear daughter, why are you worried? This is a simple black salt lying in your shelf in the kitchen, go and take that, you will get all right. She went and took the black salt, got all right. Early morning she rang to this mystic to thank him. And he, she said, last night you came and helped me, I would have died with that pain I was having. The mystic said, please forgive me, I don't go to women's houses at night. Don't, don't blame me for that. I never came. She said, I saw you, you helped me. You are my master. He said, 
if I am your master, how should I should have known that you went there? And he began to enunciate that master know nothing. That is all within within the disciple to see even the master. It's all the totality is inside each one of us. We don't, we only have triggers outside. The master is also a trigger. A master is not something that we imagine is operating from outside. No master ever operates on a spiritual path from outside. It's always from inside. The master is inside. And what we call the radiant form of the master is the master operating from inside. The outside is because we can't see the radiant form. Therefore, he appears in the same form as the disciple in order to trigger his experience inside. That's his job. It's just a job given, a mandate given to a human being like ourselves, ordinary human being. A mandate given to pick up some marked souls who are destined to go back to their home according to a plan those souls made themselves. That they made the plan to go back after certain experience in these universes. At the right time, a master appears in their life and they get initiated from the master. And master tells them things that are known only to them and they feel, this man knows, he can read my thoughts. But it's not the master reading thoughts. If you ask him, how did you know? He says, I don't know what you are talking about. So that is why that mystic said, he discovered that the totality of consciousness, the ultimate creative power, outside of which nothing exists, is inside each one of us. We are used to seeing things in a time space which is very different from what is existing inside. We see things projected out. So we believe everything has to be projected out. It's not like that. If somebody says that we are drops of an ocean, ocean of consciousness, just one drop, and we are having an experience in the midst of millions and billions of other drops all around us in human form or other forms, plants, animals, birds, all forms, angels, gods. There can be any number of forms of a drop of consciousness of an individual soul. Now, if we are having this great experience, where are we having it? Where is the creation taking place? Is it separate from the ocean? Or is it in the ocean? This was one thing that bothered me a lot when I was a child and I've shared that before with you. That when I was growing up and I was introduced to the spiritual path, I was told that we are drops from an ocean separated for a long time, maybe millions of years. We have been suffering through karma and destiny in these physical worlds, having been reborn in 8.4 forms of life. Sometimes becoming trees, sometimes becoming insects, sometimes flying like birds, sometimes animals, and ultimately with good luck we become human beings. And then we commit sins and we go back into the cycle again. And therefore in the cycle of 84, what they call 84 lakhs or 8.4 million, we have been trapped for a long time. And now with the help of a guru, with the help of a master, we are able to now travel back as a long journey, stage by stage one above the other, that we have to go from here to the astral plane. Then we travel with difficulty to the causal plane. Then with master's help and his pull, his love, we are pulled further to the soul state. And eventually he takes us back to the ocean and we merge. This was description given to me of the spiritual path. I was horrified. At least as a drop, I have some personality. The sun shines on me, I look like a rainbow. It's beautiful, I have a beauty, I have a personality, I enjoy company, I see so many people. And what they are suggesting is, I make a hard struggle and go back and merge in the ocean and lose everything. And the ocean gain nothing. It doesn't care for one more drop. Absolutely a lose-lose situation. I said, why are people following the spiritual path? If we are going to lose what we have and gain this and reach and merge in something that needs need us. But I was totally wrong. The description given was wrong. 
There are no five stages to climb. These are made up for the mind. Mind loves to the numbers. One, two, three, four, five must make sense. If I said it's all one, then it not make sense. If it's all one and everything is in the one, doesn't make sense. The truth is everything is in the one. It's only an experience being generated within that one that makes us feel like we are many at different levels. Therefore, to describe them as different planes of consciousness or universes placed one above the other is only a good picture, graphic picture for our mind. Mind loves graphic pictures. Not true. The truth is that it is a game being played within the ocean. I realized if one drop left the ocean, it will not be a complete ocean. If one soul left the Paramatma or the Creator, it will not be Creator anymore. He is supposed to be total. Therefore, a soul cannot leave. A drop cannot leave the ocean. And the ocean should remain complete. So what is the truth then? The truth you discover by going back inside your consciousness and discovering that the ocean never lost any drops, nor any drop left the ocean to come back after many millions of years. The drop is still in the ocean. In fact, it is in the ocean. The ocean can contract its awareness of itself to a drop and become many drops. It still remains the ocean. The ocean and the drops are the same. There are many drops in ocean or in one ocean with many drops. We are souls within the totality of consciousness or what we call the ultimate creative power. So what the spiritual path is, is not traveling somewhere with a struggle to go back, just to regain our awareness who we are. Stage by stage, we regain our awareness and we discover we were the ocean all the time. If you tell people that this drop contains the whole ocean, it's not understood because our life here is on a space-time basis where we have to see everything spread out. How can a whole ocean fit into a drop? You can't understand it. But that's the truth. The whole ocean is not only in the drop, it is in the drop hidden secretly in created universes, in created bodies, which don't really exist. They are only created for experience. That's the beauty of it. That the drop, which we call the Atma or the soul, is not sitting by itself. Within the ocean, it has covered itself by creative power with different forms in order to have different experiences. And what are those forms? First form that covers the little drop or the wood or the soul is what we think is our mind. The thinking mind is nothing more than a created device so that the soul which has consciousness can empower it to function in a created time and space. If we don't have that cover, there is no time and space. Just by putting on a cover, of our own mind. It's a nice cover though. Because with this cover, we create completely different type of experiences. Vast experiences. Infinite time. We create infinite space, infinite time, just with one little cover. One mind can do that. And the mind also performs many other functions. Biggest function it can perform with the help of the soul is think. It can think. It makes the soul able to think by using the mind. And that's a big thing because when you think, it can only take place in time and space. Even the smallest thought needs time. So the mind creates a space and time in order to think. And by thinking, it traps us because when more experiences are generated around it by having another cover upon itself, it begins to get so attached and enjoying those things so much by thinking that thinking itself becomes our trap. What is the second cover upon our soul after the mind? Second cover is the experience of dividing. The perception of created space and time 
in two different senses that what could be perceived as a universe can now be seen, heard, touched, tasted, smelled. It's another cover. Beautiful cover. Such a variety of experiences have been generated just by having a second cover on our soul. And third cover, third cover, a material body made with atoms and molecules, a physical body. What happens with the physical body? The entire experience becomes physical. And that's wonderful. Here's a soul with covered the mind, covered with sense perceptions, covered with the physical body, makes the entire creation physical. If you remove the physical body, there is no physical universe at all. Sometimes we think physical universe exists by itself and we've just come for a little while and people talk of billions of light years away. So many 15, 14 billion, 13 billion years ago, the universe was created from the Big Bang. Nobody knows where, where it was taking place. Even scientists don't know. If a Big Bang had to take place, and say took place exactly on a date, they know the date now, 13.4 billion years ago. A big bang took place and the whole universe came into being, including time and space. They all came into being at once. But nobody knows where it took place. They try to say, did it take place from where we are using our telescopes, using our instruments to find out? Then we must be the center of the big bang. They observed a very strange thing in this physical universe that is expanding. That's very strange. The Big Bang took place and the whole universe started expanding. It was expanding universe. So that is still expanding. At what rate is it expanding? We keep on changing our estimate. At what rate is this universe expanding? I learned in my BSc class maybe 60, 70 years ago, 70 years ago when I was studying, that the expansion is so uniform that we are all expanding at the same time. And we are all expanding, the room is expanding, so therefore we don't notice the expansion. But a problem arose shortly after that. They found out that the velocity of light does not change. That created a problem. If velocity of light does not change, that means if the sun is moving away from us, it should take more time. It took eight and a half minutes thousand years ago, it's taking eight and a half minutes today. So this universe is not expanding. It took several decades of research by the scientists to say, no, there is a membrane protecting some parts from expanding. And it's not the objects that are expanding. We are not expanding. Space is expanding. And that also created many problems. If space is expanding, then the objects should move further away from each other. Only galaxies, only things billions of years, light years away, they are moving away. No, nothing else is moving away. So new the theoretical models have been set up. How this expansion is being controlled and the new membrane theory has come up. Some new string theories have come up in order to explain how we are not expanding. But we are the universal state and time does not expand. The velocity of light does not change. Now another problem has come. The velocity of light does not change. It's always 8.84 lakhs what is it? per second, this miles per second is velocity. Now velocity, the velocity of light is constant. Einstein said, others said, even now they say it's constant. But it has a unique feature. It is constant at all times, no matter in what circumstance. For example, if you're driving a car, you're driving at 40 miles an hour, another car passes us at 60 miles an hour. We won't feel it 60 miles. We feel it 20 miles. We are going in the same direction. But if light is going in one direction 
another beam of light is going. The difference in the speed between the two is the velocity of light. Never changes. How can that be? But that's the truth about light. Ultimately, the whole discussion is now on what is light. And if nothing can move faster than the velocity of light, which has created more problems, because now we can observe there are black holes and everything is being pulled into the black hole. Current studies show that when everything is pulled into the, into the black hole, including light, it is pulling at a speed greater than the velocity of light and new discovery. So we keep on changing. Physics keeps on changing its theoretical models based on any new observation we make. What was true in only a few hundred years ago, it was a belief that the earth is flat, that if we go to the edge of the earth, we'll fall off and go into space. Somebody said, no earth is round, and they threatened to kill him for saying that. That you're blasphemous. The earth is flat. Only a few hundred years ago, in England, which is supposed to be still an educated country compared to many other countries at that time, had produced great poets and writers, Shakespeare, for example. At the very time when Shakespeare existed, people seriously believed, scientists believed, that they were witches and they burned them on the stake. Live women were being burned. So we, we have added to our knowledge so rapidly and changed everything from minor observations. Whereas the whole thing can be understood and explained if you see the source of this creation, and see where it's all happening. And all answers can be found within yourself. Because what happens? Going within yourself means that going within the covers that have been put upon the soul. It does not mean travel at all. It only means withdrawing your attention from the cover. If you withdraw your attention from the physical cover, physical body, and put it behind where the consciousness is operating from at a third eye center. After a while, you won't know where your body is. It's just a matter of practice. You can practice, but if you're thinking of outside things all the time, it won't happen. This requires what is called concentration of attention. It's a great gift given to all human beings that we not only have the capacity of putting attention where we like, we can also concentrate it where we like, including concentrating attention on our own self. When we say, put your attention on third eye center, it only means put your attention on where you are, not the body. That's all. If you can imagine that your body is merely a cover, say a house you live in, a moving house in which you live, and because of the structure of the body, because of the various organs placed into it, because of the energy centers which exist below the eyes, ignore them. The energy centers, they are not centers of awareness at all. People are trying to do yoga of various kinds to find awareness and they end up finding energy of different kinds. Awareness is only behind the eyes and above, it's a small section of the body. If you are able to consider this body to be a house of yours, in which you leave a mobile house, and you are driving it, driving it from the driver's seat to the back of the eyes, between the ears. If you can feel that, experience that, put your attention on that, do nothing else but do that, gradually you will feel that you know body. First starting you feel where are your hands gone, where are your feet gone. Where your legs have gone, where your arms have gone, and then your whole body is gone, and you are very alive and active and can see better, can hear better, can touch better, can smell better, can use all five senses better than you could in the physical body. This is not a theory. Anybody can do it. Check it out. It's only first step on discovering who you are. It's only the first step to tell you the physical body is not you, that you exist within the physical body. And sometimes referring to the six centers of energy, the chakras, 
I call it the sixth floor of our house. If you were able to sit in the center of the sixth floor of your house and just think of what is happening there, use all your thoughts to make your attention concentrate itself on what is happening in the center of your sixth floor of your body. You'll get the experience of gradually losing the awareness of your body. Some people have tried it. Some told me it's a very scary thing. We don't want to do it. I said, why are you scared? You're trying to find who you are. Why are you scared? They said, it felt like we're going to die. Which is true. The body actually dies also like that. The actual death that takes place in the body is exactly like that. That you first don't come to know where your hands and arms are going. Then you don't know where your legs are. Then you don't know where your torso is. And when your body is dying up, it dies in stages. It goes up. You can't speak. You try to you tell people. You can't tell anything. But you're still seeing with your eyes. People can see that your eyes are moving, but they can't speak. And then you die in your head. Brain dead. The body is nothing. You're gone. So the experience is so similar. It's even been called dying while living. So the experience has scared many people. So it has to be done if you are interested in that experience of knowing that you are not the body, but you have a much longer life span, that you have much longer memory, you have much sharper sense perceptions. You can try it. You won't die. Nobody has died trying this experiment. Not even a natural death. Isn't that amazing? Natural death can take place any time. But nobody practicing this has ever died. Even natural death. So that is why you would really die. Your body will function. Your heart will beat. Your breathing will take place. Everything will be normal. All vital signs will be normal when you get this experiment. So this experiment can tell you that you are not the body. But you have sense perceptions. Very, very sharp. You can also move further. And become unaware of the sense perceptions by doing the same thing in the inner body because you still have eyes, not these eyes. When we imagine something and see in our head, which eyes are we using? We can make a picture of something and imagine with our eyes closed, which, picture, which eyes are we using? Inner eyes. They are the astral eyes. They are the sensory eyes. If those eyes were not there, you would not be able to see even with these eyes. It's those eyes that enable you to see with physical eyes. It's the inner body that, and the soul, mind and inner body that helps to keep this body alive. Otherwise it will be dead. So therefore, when you withdraw your attention, you are going to a bigger life, a longer life. The astral body estimated to have a life of 1,000 to 3,000 physical years. So we have had the same astral body with several forms of physical life. And the same body, some people call it soul. Those who believe in transmigration, the migration from one body to another, they say the soul left and went there. Souls never leave, never leave anything. Souls don't move. Souls don't need to, they don't have space time to move. It's only the astral body that moves from one body to another to have a much longer life. But that's not all. Supposing you were to do the same practice of withdrawal of attention within the inner body and forget about the outer body, you can also become unaware of the sense perceptions and reach the point from where all the space-time is created. That means the soul and mind alone. The soul and mind connection is so strong for so long. The mind also has a life. It's a cover. But last millions of physical years, three, five, three to five million years, the average age of the mind. During that time, we have had several astral bodies and several physical bodies as roamed around in these experiences. But if you have a mind and soul together, the soul is consciousness. Mind is a device to use consciousness. Soul makes the mind alive. And also makes the astral body and the physical body alive. Without soul, nothing can be alive. It's life. Soul makes the mind alive and the mind can think. The mind thinks 
continuously. It, if it stops thinking, it will die. People don't realize their mind thinking is like its heartbeat. The heartbeat of this body, heart doesn't beat, we die. If the mind doesn't think, it will die. People who claim we can still the mind and we can stop thinking, they've been proven wrong again and again. They are still thinking another channel. They think we have stopped thinking. So if you are able to reach that state where the mind and soul alone are there, you will get answers to almost every question that you ever asked in your life. Because all the answers are right there. Nobody can ever ask a question if the answer is not sitting there. That is why your access to all the answers to all the questions anybody has ever asked or lying inside. Imagine the kind of experiences we all are carrying inside our body and inner body. That's it. So once we are able to find that the mind and the soul are put together and thinking is creating time and space, that is where the current scientists are coming to that past, present and future exist at the same time. And why were they created? Why was time created in a form that we say we are sitting at the what in the middle at a now, which has no time, and we are experiencing a past, a present which has no time, and a future. Why was it created like that? It was created so we could have experience of events, period. Events were placed at the same time as time was created. And you can go check it out. That all events of all kinds were placed. And you could pick up a particular device, a DVD, what we call destiny. You could pick up your destiny and play it out in the mind or play it out with the sensory body or play it in the physical body. Destiny is all made there. And you have a choice. You have a choice to pick up a destiny. We came, created this experience as individual souls in order to have a short experience, say, one life. Many religions believe there is only one life because, in fact, we came for one life. We came for one life, but no life can be created on events unless the law that was used to create events has, has to be followed. The law was events can be connected with each other by a principle of cause and effect. Thereby, we created a big law, also called law of karma. Karma is nothing else except the law of cause and effect. Everything that happened in the events was connected with each other by cause and effect. And when we picked up a destiny, we picked up where we are going to make a selection of those events. When we say, I want this event, there is a follow-up. Because it becomes a cause, you are in follow-up. You say there is a karma. Our karma, our actions, our intentions are creating our life. That's how it be created. But there is a big trap. Because when we express our intention, we can express our intention to be attached to an experience taking place at either the mental level or astral level or physical level. You can express an intention, okay, I want a big house. If you don't get a big house, it's registered there in the event, it has to have an effect. And it cannot be done for the one life, it must take place in another life. Therefore, it becomes a series of lives. We got trapped by our own use of the system, use of the time sequences and the events on it and we got caught up in it. Otherwise we would have gone back in one life, just taken back a little show we have come to see, a theatre. Just a small show, we could have seen the show and gone back. But we of course wanted to have the experience and we got trapped. Of course we were not uh, that stupid I believe in, uh, as in our in a singular form as a soul. Soul had all the awareness, could have all the intelligence. So soul made an arrangement that if it gets trapped, it will find a way to come out. And therefore it designed its way to come out. Even before the dissolution of the whole show. 
distribution takes place of the whole show also. The whole creation collapses after some time. Sometimes it collapses only at a certain level, which we call it paralaya, dissolution. Or sometimes we call it mahaparala, grand dissolution, where everything is dissolved, including the mind, and all minds are dissolved. Otherwise, this smaller portion of the created universe is dissolved. We made an arrangement that if we want to come before the dissolution, then we should have an experience at some point when we want to come back, which should actually bring us back when we want. That experience translates in physical life into the appearance in our life of a human being who tells us, let's go back home. He doesn't appear for nothing. When a perfect living master appears in our life and he appears, we don't find him. We find all kinds of teachers. We find people who teach how to do meditation. We find people how to get samadhis, people who tell yoga. But a perfect living master does not come to teach anything. He's our own arrangement that we want to go back. He appears at that very time which we tested. We should not be staying here longer than that. When he appears, he doesn't say stay more here. He says go back. Let's go back. And he doesn't say, okay, I'll tell you to teach you the way to go back. He says, let's go back together. It's a big difference between teachers and a perfect living master. He comes and says, the way to go back is within you. I am also within you, if you want to check it out. And we'll both go back to our true home together. Time has come. That's the role. That's the arrangement we made. And a very good arrangement it was. So therefore, when we say, well, we are now seeking something and we'll find a master and all that, it doesn't work like that. It never works like that. Why is it that we can't find a master? The reason is, the master has not come to teach us how to show something bigger or to make us better people. He's come just like ourselves, as ordinary as we are. If he's extraordinary, he won't be a master. His main way of taking us back is to be our friend. And friendship cannot be with people who are sitting up on a pedestal, who we put high up, or who do unnatural, miraculous things. Supposing a master came into this room doing something unnatural, like flying in the sky, and he flew all over us, and we would all watch, what will we be thinking? We'll think maybe there is some string attached. This is, then we'll try to say, no, there is no string attached. Some of us will get frightened. Some of us will admire. Some of us may even worship. But nobody will be a friend of that guy. If he happens to fall down, all of us will rush to him. Are you hurt? And first time we can have an experience of friendship. Friendship itself requires that the person who we call a perfect living master should be as ordinary as ourselves. Otherwise, he is well worth worshipping, worth admiring, but not being a friend. Friend has to be something like us, so we can travel together. That is why the main pull that a perfect living master exercises on us when we are in human form here is he becomes our friend. There used to be a great disciple of my master. I tell many stories of him, Dr. Isha Singh, the veterinary doctor. And toward the end of his life, he told me very clearly, he says a master has to be a friend first before he can be a master. It's not the other way around. It's not that you find a master, he becomes a friend. No, he has to be a friend first. And then only your mind will know he's a master. Otherwise, your mind will doubt all the time because it's too ordinary. It's a very ordinariness that is required for a perfect living master. Extraordinariness required for others. The only extraordinariness of an ordinary person who is a perfect living master is his friendship, his love. It's different. It's different. It has no conditions attached. It has no judgment attached. If such a person will never say, be a good person, then I will help you. He'll never judge any of our karma. 
He judges karma by Almighty judging karma. Everybody is judging our karma. The laws of the universe are judging our karma. He doesn't come to judge. He comes to be a true friend above our mind, above our karma. That is unconditional love. He will love you once he has found you because he has come for that. He will love you if you love him. He will love you if you don't. He will love you if you hate him. He will love you if you kill him. That is the kind of love which is unconditional. So that makes him extraordinary, otherwise very ordinary. The main thing that makes such a person extraordinary is his extraordinary friendship and love. If that is not there, they are not a master. So that is why there is a big difference in the roles of one who has come to take us back home from others who are going to teach us how to meditate. And there are lots of people teaching us how to meditate, but very few who have come for those people who have said, this is my time, I am ready to go back home, I am tired of this show, I don't want to be here anymore. If you say, I am having a good time, I am enjoying myself, enjoy, that's what you came for. If you think this is a wonderful place to be in, enjoy. But when you say, I am tired, and inside you a seeking, a longing comes, that this is not my place, I know I have to go. At that time, a perfect living master will appear in your life. It, he'll appear by coincidence, by accident, in a strange way, but he will appear. You say, when a chela is ready, when a disciple is ready, the guru appears, the master appears. It doesn't say when a chela is ready, he can find a master. You could find if it was extraordinary, wearing special robes or special style of living, or showing miracles in the streets, you could find him. But that would not qualify him to be a friend or to be a companion on a spiritual journey. I am sharing these things with you because I know all of you sitting here are seekers. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sharing these things. You are seekers seeking the same thing I am seeking. I was very fortunate that a great master by accident found me and gave me some experiences which satisfied me and I thought I should share those experiences with you so that you can also be ready for going back home as your time has come. That's why you are here. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. So I am congratulating you for this. I just wanted to explain how this process works, what the reality of our creation is and how we can go back to our true home. I'll have a lunch break now. Enjoy the lunch and I'll see you about 3.15.